<laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Radical Self-Respect with Jared Mello. As you can see, I have a guest, Nick Bertuccio. He's an online fitness and nutrition coach, and it's going to be very interesting to speak to him today. He's on a similar wavelength as many of the people that follow this channel are, and I think his perspective will be very unique because it's not going to be the kinds of things I normally talk about on here a lot, I don't think. So I think it's going to be pretty educational. But how are you doing, man? Thanks, Jared. I'm good. Thanks for having me, brother. My pleasure. So let's start at the very beginning here. The very beginning for you, you had struggled with addiction, I guess, a while ago, correct? Mm -hmm. So perhaps you could explain a little bit how that went down for you and what that was like. Okay. So growing up, I was your typical skinny, awkward, unathletic, not good at sports, like that type of kid, right? I graduated high school 110 pounds. As you'll hear a lot of people in recovery say, I never felt like I really fit in, right? Like I always felt like, I don't know, there was some critical day in school where everybody else learned this skill that I just missed or sure, something. Sure. And I ended up I guess self-medicating those feelings eventually, right? Got into addiction really, really bad. And I am totally losing my train of thought. What was your drug of choice? Heroin and cocaine, speed Yeah, I, I was on that train too. <laughs> uh, the best worst train takes you to your knees really quick. Well, I mean, for me and the opiates, like you said, opiates in particular, it medicated whatever issues I had were going on in me. Usually it was anxiety back then, but whatever that was, it would go away instantly, and all of a sudden I was the most confident and energetic and charismatic, fun person, or at least in my mind I was. Mm -hmm. And it was a little true in the beginning too, mind you. It wasn't just fairy tales. Like People would tell me, oh, I like you so much more when you're on this. Oh, you sound so much better. And it was because of all the nonsense I was probably like masking with that stuff, right? And so it became a challenge. I'm like, man, I mean, I mean, people are telling me they like me better when I'm on this stuff. Ouch, talk about reinforcing, yeah. yeah. And so it wasn't until the dope side of things did things get really bad. Then those charismatic things, you're not too charismatic when you're dipping chin to chest. Mm -mm. No. <laughs> and you're burning cigarette holes in your pants. You're not too charismatic no, then. Not so well spoken. No, no. So you did this route. You're doing heroin. You're doing coke. Mm -hmm. What was... I guess eventually the bottom for you in that regard. So I had lots, right? What do they say? Every bottom's got a trap door. Sure. Um, but at the worst of it, I was homeless in Camden, you know, begging people for change, trying to get my fix, pawned all the family heirlooms, burned all my bridges, you know, the usual story. Um, went to a bazillion different treatments. Right. Uh, did the halfway house thing, sort of. I, I didn't last very long. I lived in one in West Palm when I was 18. I think I lasted like a week and I was living in a ditch next to a Walmart shooting Delauded. Shooting Delauded. I hear that's big in Florida. The and yeah, I couldn't find heroin. Yeah, this is like Or say, cocaine. It's not big. I'm surprised you couldn't find cocaine. So close to there. Miami, I, right. I just didn't know what I was doing. I'm sure that's it was probably there. more about what that was. Yeah. <laughs> but so you go into a bunch of different rehabs too. Mm hmm. Which ones, I guess maybe you shouldn't say which ones, but they didn't work for you? All the popular ones around here I've been to. Yeah. I've only been to one. Okay. One rehab, and I'm 37 now. How old are you? 29. So you're 29. So when you were, let's see here, when you were 12 is when I was in the rehab here. Okay. Seven, 17 years ago. And I'll never forget the day I left that rehab was the first day I did heroin. Because I, of course, I exited AMA against medical advice because I wasn't ready to get better. And looking back at who I was then, I was, there were so many issues I just didn't know I had. The anxiety, the mental health stuff. And they, and I was a quiet kid. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to slip through the cracks. Like they didn't see what was really going on because when you're quiet, they confuse that you're doing good. Right. You're, you're just, you know, you're doing what you're told, you're being, you're obeying. And so I slipped through all the cracks and I left. And I just got worse and I learned how to do the old I'm not sure if they were doing this when you were doing it down there, but that was back when you still copped in the corners and things. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, I hear it's different. I hear what happens is you got to go to people's houses now, apparently. The days of copping on the street are over. Did you know that? 
No, from what I understand, Camden and Kensington are still pretty there, open air. I think Kensington still From what open I air. hear, still zombie town. Camden, on the other hand, though, they do need, you need to know someone, I think. Okay. That's how that goes. But I'm content to not know that well, information. Good, good. <laughs> but Kensington, it is like the Wild West down there, man. Mm -hmm. Certainly at the Wild West. But back I've to got you. a buddy that lives there, and it's crazy because they've had... Like they're putting nice housing in there now. So you'll have this uh, beautiful apartment, you know what I mean? These business people, and then they walk out their front door and there's just three people passed out on the sidewalk. It's like a culture shock. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, to divert from the story here, what do you think about legalized drugs? I very much agree. I think that they should be. And I mean that even when we're talking about stuff, meth, cocaine, heroin. All of it. All of it, because here's the thing. If... You were, if we legalized heroin tomorrow, I'd be willing to bet that most of the people watching this podcast would not go out and do heroin, right? right? And the few percent, the small percentage of people that don't already do it, that would try it once it was legalized, are people that on some level would have been willing to try it even with it being illegal given the right set of circumstances anyway. You know what I mean? It, right, wrong place, wrong time, horrible life trauma, Whatever. On the flip side, if you legalized it, first of all, now it's not fentanyl. Now it's heroin. That's the now people me, right? know the dose that they're doing. Every time they're doing it, they can do the same dose every single time. Now people have access to safe, clean, sterile injection equipment. You know what I mean? You remove a lot of the stigma so people are more likely to get treatment when they're ready. You know, some people still aren't, obviously, but... And I think more importantly than any of that, you defund massive organized crime. Like massive, massive organized crime. Like where, what do they have left after that? Human trafficking, which is its own beast and horribly awful. But I mean, it's probably 50-50, right? Drugs and that, you're cutting out half of Here's their the finances. Here's the for you. Because I'm, I'm all on board with you 100% with this. I think legalizing the drugs will get rid of those cartels in Central America and South America. And it would give people the opportunity to not get criminal records here and like to really destroy everything. And I mm -hmm. don't think there'd be too many people doing heroin just because it's legal, like you said. Right. Maybe people who are already susceptible to it, they might. But I don't think it's going to hurt too many other people. There are people who are going to do it. They're going to do it anyway. Whether it's legal or illegal, they're going to do it. Exactly. And so I'm, I'm all about freedom. So I say, if that's what they want to do, who is the government to say what you can and cannot put in your body? That's kind of what I see about it. Now, to play the devil's advocate part, here in New Jersey, they just legalize weed. Mm -hmm. Now, I imagine there's still a black market for weed. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it's like, I don't really like weed, but... I think people are still buying from the black market because I think it's expensive in the dispensary. Absolutely. Right? So perhaps maybe that would also still happen if like the coke, crack, heroin, meth was all still legal too. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I think it would help. I think I don't think it would the business from the black market couldn't grow, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Could it? I don't think so because the reason, I mean, it's a cheap drug to begin with, right? Well, sure. heroin, anyway. But I think it would be even cheaper if it was legal. The only reason it even is the little bit of money that it is cost, that it does cost, is the criminal penalties associated with it, right? And I mean, it's also a very different perspective. You know, legalizing recreational marijuana as more of a recreational substance for people to enjoy to relax versus legalizing a highly addictive almost for people that are addicted, maintenance kind of drug where the average user is extremely poor. Well, you know the bullshit is. The bullshit is Suboxone's legal, Methadone's legal, Wild Turkey is legal, or all these Well, these Suboxone benzos. and Methadone make Big Pharma an outrageous amount of money. Suboxone probably more so. Mm -hmm. Have, well, you Methadone at one point I'm sure did, right? I'm not Was sure methadone about Methadone. Was Methadone always marketed as like a public... I don't know too much about the history of methadone. History lesson from methadone. I know it because I was on methadone years ago. Okay. The Nazis invented methadone. They invented methadone as a cheap alternative to morphine because their supply chain issues, they weren't able to get it. To use as a legitimate pain reliever. Yes. Okay. And so one of their Nazi scientists came up with methadone. And that was the beginning of methadone. And I think it was the 60s or the 70s they decided, you know what? 
this is a nice long-acting opiate here. We should give this to the heroin addicts to help them get off of heroin. Mm -hmm. And that way they won't be I don't know, doing as much crime as they were and all the petty theft and that kind of good stuff. And so I can see where their heads were at. Methadone was actually where I kind of started my opiate problems. I went backwards. I started with methadone, then did Oxycontin, then did heroin. Okay. And then to Suboxone, and then nothing. <laughs> you were just zigzagging all kinds of out of order. Well, you know, methadone was my favorite because I had severe anxiety. And that would medicate the anxiety the best of all. Without and it lasted feeling a long time. super intoxicated. But, well, in the beginning, I was, I was getting wrecked in the very beginning. But only in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. After the first few times, you know, you take, you'd get used to it. Right, because that's why they give it out as maintenance, right? Because right. it's supposed to be the least oh, recreational. I got myself in all sorts of trouble with just methadone. I was vomiting in the pot sink at this retirement home I used to work at. They sent me to get drug tested, and I got fired because I failed for coke and methadone. Good times. Oh, yeah, this was, like I said, that was like 20 years ago now. I'm 19, saying. 20 years. But I liked it, but it wasn't until I realized I needed to take something to address the underlying stuff. Now all I do is I take supplements now. Okay. I mean, if you watch the channel, I talk about supplements a lot. Supplements can go far away. Mm -hmm. And I don't I agree. Take, I don't take any prescription drugs or anything. Mm -hmm. But I don't mind if people do. I mean, if someone takes it, I say, whatever helps you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say to anyone you're wrong. You shouldn't be taking an SSRI or you shouldn't take an antipsychotic. I say, hey, whatever works for you. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get off and you don't think you're doing good, then I'll, I'll help you and support you do that with that decision too. I agree but, very much. Right. So back to the, to the story again. So you said your bottoms had some basements and some trap doors. Mm -hmm. Was there like a grand finale of the bottom? No. So people ask me that a lot. Like why, how were you able to stop? And I'll be honest, I don't even really remember. You know what I mean? It wasn't like cumulative for me. It was right. always like, you know, six months, relapse, nine months, relapse, two months, relapse. And most of the times I relapsed, it wasn't like a run. It was literally like I'd go buy one bag of dope, one bag of Coke, put them both in a needle, <laughs> do them once, fucking feel good for 30 seconds, and then hate myself <laughs> and get back on the horse the next day. Like it was, I mean, it's never worth it, but even from a using standpoint, it was totally not worth it. So were you doing it. like the rooms or anything at that point? Like yeah, a, a, a? so in and out of all this time, all 12 step stuff. Okay. So when I was clean at that time, it was absolute abstinence, like full by the book. First was NA, I did NA for a long time because I was turned off of AA because I felt like they were prejudiced against drug addicts and I didn't want to deal with those old timers and I felt like it was stupid. And then I couldn't get any fucking clean time in NA. And not that there aren't people who take NA seriously and really work the steps. I did find some of them. There are some. I did find some, don't get me wrong. But for me, and maybe it was just my maturity level and where I was at in my recovery at the time, it just, it wasn't there. Right. And there was a guy that I went to NA with that had left and found a big book step study group in AA who I reached out to who was basically like, look, man, I had the same issue. Here's what worked for me. If you're interested, I'll bring you to this meeting. And so I went to this meeting and it was the first time it was a big book step study meeting. And it was the first time people, you know, they're clutching their big books and talking about it, but it was, it was deep, real life, practical inner work kind of stuff. You know what I mean? It wasn't just somebody telling their story that we all have more or less the same story with a few details changed, right? It wasn't a bunch of 20 something year olds that looked like they were dressed to go to a fashion show, not a meeting because they were just worried about who they were gonna talk to and hook up with after the meeting and who they were texting across the room. You know sure. what I mean? Like it was, it was none of that, it was serious. It was people who really wanted to get better. And not just get better in terms of not using or drinking, but get better in terms of fixing, like you said, the underlying stuff that was making them use or drink or the underlying stuff that was left even after they stopped. Right. So that was extremely attractive to me. Sure. Well, they say AA, there's more maturity there, people that have been there for a while, and they've gained some wisdom hopefully over the years. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people have talked about it the same way you just did. And then NA... It helps people get their foot in the door 
sprinkles in some recovery for some people, but a lot of them are younger. Mm -hmm. And with being younger comes different kinds of problems. People still want to date and they still want to hook up and maybe they don't have a family yet or anything and they still, they're still trying to do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it just changes the dynamic. Now, I like when I was going to NA, I did meet a lot of good people there. There's people mm -hmm. there that they are really doing the work. You know, They do the step working guide. They write on all the steps. And they have a lot of self-awareness. That self-awareness part is key. So you eventually were able to latch on to AA and that, that message kind of stuck for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, same message, I guess, right? But I guess it was the way it was delivered. I don't think I was really hearing it in NA exactly because of today. what you were saying. It's you know, not I what just, is said, it's how it's said so often. Right, and not just how it's said, but how it's received. That too. Right, and you know, that, that's more on me. Right, and my too, mindset, yes. not only my mindset in terms of where I was in my head and my life when I was in NA versus AA, but in terms of my mindset and how open I was to the information based on my preconceived notions of I'm at NA, this is what NA is, I'm at AA, this is what AA is. You know what I mean? Because you can get the same information from two different places and hear it completely differently because sure. of your expectations of information coming from those two different places. So what do you think was the best thing about AA? What helps you the most? Probably step, I mean, cliche to say, the fourth step, right, was really breaking that down. In particular, the resentments. Aha! You know, like, actually, like, I've, it's been years, so I'm not gonna remember exactly how this works. But I remember writing out the resentments and it was like which area of your life it affected and there were like sexual relations, money relations, pride. I forget off the top of my head, it's been so long what the other areas was were. But that exercise and I filled up an entire notebook <laughs> with it. And not only that exercise, but then going over that with someone else and really like saying things that I had never said to another human before, like, okay, this is why this really bothered me because I actually feel this kind of way about this and this brought up that and it made me feel that like that, I think was really, I mean, you mentioned self-awareness, right? That's what it's all about. That's the big one. That was key for me. In That's that, the big one. Was learning. I mean, I guess on some level I already had that information, right? But putting it to paper and then reading that paper out loud made me more aware of it. Sure. Well, I think, especially in the fourth step, you get patterns. You, know, you recognize the patterns. And I remember the defects I used to write about would be jealousy, and there would be dishonesty, often about what you were thinking and feeling. And then resentment was the other one. Right? Those big three, boom, they were rampant in my life. But just recognizing the patterns and where they came out in my own life, that was humongous. Mm -hmm. So that was, I'll never, I think everyone, everyone should probably write on the steps at some point, whether you're, you're an addict or not. I agree with that very much. I used to say that right. in the meetings. But, but I'll also say this. I'll say, my, my also my opinion is, I think everyone is addicted to something. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a matter of what they're addicted to and then how frequently they do it. Absolutely. Right? So it just depends. Everyone has a different thing. Everyone's escaping in some way or another. It's just a matter of whether they can reel it in. Some people, they can't reel it in too good, right? And they, right. they go off the deep end and they're rock, they go off. Right, it's but, like what's step one, unmanageable. Yes. Right, like it's the difference of some people can do this and it doesn't affect their life and they can manage it and other people can't. Whether right. that this is drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling, porn, food, whatever. You know what I mean? Some people can handle it in small amounts, whatever. I mean, there's some stuff you could argue is not handleable at all, but right. same concept. Yeah, most, not too many people will be smoking crack in a manageable way. No, <laughs> no, not probably not. <laughs> not often. There's some, uh, he's a PhD professor, and I'm not going to remember his name off the top of my head, but he's an outspoken, I don't know what university he's a professor at, but he's an outspoken recreational, and I put that in quotes, recreational crack heroin or? user, oh, and I, maybe heroin. crack cocaine too. Several hard drugs, and he, I mean, it's very like prestigious 
gentleman who writes research papers and is well regarded in the scientific community. Right. Uh, it's very interesting. You know, there are some very liberal folks who do think that way. Mm-hmm. I remember listening to Joe Rogan, and he would have doctors and people on his show that would talk about recreational Percocet or recreational whatever. I mean, you know he's big into the tripping stuff, Rogan, DMT and mm-hmm. shrooms, maybe even acid too. But, I mean, mindset is so important with it, I think, too. So I could see a recreational perhaps with an opiate before I could see it with, like, crack, I guess. But I think either like, of those would be really tricky. It's going to be <laughs> tough for people. you got to have a real strong sense of your sober, clean self. Mm-hmm. To even be able to think about doing something like that, right? But some people do, and with their pain pills, I guess, right? People who take pain pills, they'll take an Oxycontin or a Perk 30. And I just, I guess it depends on the frequency of how often they got to take it. Because if you take that shit every day, you are addicted to it. You are at least physically dependent. Right. Well, I was going to say that's how the medical terminology, they right. differ the definition between dependence and addiction, right? Dependence is similar, I'm physically dependent. If I stop taking this medication suddenly, I will experience withdrawal symptoms. Right. Addiction is the mental compulsion to take that substance despite negative consequences, right? You know what I'll say to that? I don't think that's all garbage. You know why? Because addiction... You take away food and water from someone, and you better believe they'll be acting just as depraved as any heroin addict or meth Mm -hmm. addict or coke addict or meth head, whatever. You you take away water and food for them for a few days, they're doing all the same things. Absolutely. But but yet, we all need food and water to survive, Mm -hmm. and yet maybe it takes a few days for that to occur. It does not like instant, like a drug, like you only got, what, a 24-hour grace period if you're lucky when it comes to drugs. You know, you'll still be getting a little crazy, though, go two days without food and water, mm-hmm. and then tell me how normal you'll be. Right. And what, and what you, would you be willing to do to eat at that point? Absolutely. Would you want to lie, cheat, steal? Probably. Mm-hmm. So that's just my pushback on the addict thing, because I don't think it matters. I don't think... And they do this with other kind of supplements and stuff today to try to make them illegal, mm-hmm. where it's like, whether it's dependence or addiction, like, it should always be up to the citizen. What do you want to do? If right, you, And some people will abuse things. Mm-hmm. Some people will abuse it and they'll go off the deep end. And look at alcohol and cigarettes. Two perfect examples. Alcohol is legal to everyone and alcohol can mess up a lot of people. And does it cause mm-hmm. addiction? Sure. But dependence? Sure. But do I think it should be illegal? No. No, it's your responsibility as the person ingesting that yes. substance. Exactly. I can go get a gallon of bleach at Home Depot and drink it. That's going to have <laughs> horrible consequences, but that's not illegal. So and that's going to have horrible consequences. Well, like, let's say I don't have, you could argue, the cost of society, right? If I don't have health insurance and I go buy bleach, who's footing that bill? The taxpayers mm-hmm. for my irresponsible use of that substance. So it, it's not that much different sure, no matter sure. how you try to argue it. But I want to touch on the food thing you said because that's interesting. So with what I do with the coaching, I see this a lot with food. That it is not only an addiction, you know, in the sense of like emotional eating and stuff like that. And obviously you need it to survive. But just in general, people don't realize how addicted they are to the dopamine response of food. Right? Like when I put somebody on a nutrition plan... And they tell me, you know, I'm not even hungry, but between this hour and this hour before bed, I just can't stop snacking. Like people don't realize how mindless it is, right? And when people, and I'm being in recovery yourself, you would know this, the justifications, the rationalizations, right? The, okay, well, I know I said I wasn't going to use today, but this happened, so I'm going to get clean tomorrow. Or it's just one this, or it's not dope, it's just a Percocet, it's just methadone, it's just Suboxone. It's all those same rationalizations. I hear that same kind of shit from my clients sure. all the time in regards to oh. food. Like you bullshit yourself when you are trying to, like you don't think you're an addict or you don't think you have any addictive tendencies, go on a diet. Sure. And watch how fast you can Absolutely. now suddenly relate Absolutely. to a heroin addict. We know what I've heard with that stuff too, with the snacking, especially in the evening. Mm-hmm. Usually they say it's a low serotonin symptom. And people are eating to get that boost of serotonin. Mm-hmm. Which is why they say supplementing with a 5-HTP can really prevent some of that late night snacking like that. I'm not sure if you tell your clients about that or not. But mm-hmm. to me, because I used to get that a lot too, 5-HTP really has helped. 
But who are your ideal clients and the people that you help the most? So ideally, it's not so much a matter of somebody trying to put on muscle or somebody trying to get skinny in terms of that end of the spectrum. For me, my target client is someone who has a severe self-esteem issue and lack of confidence in relation to their body image, whether that's because they're overweight, whether that's because they're skinny, whether that's maybe they don't have an issue with body composition, maybe it's a performance issue and they're really insecure about that and so they have no confidence or self-esteem because they're not good at XYZ or they used to be good at XYZ and they're not anymore. You know, because that was my story. That was what fitness did for me. Right. It was at one time drugs were the answer to deal with that never feeling good enough feeling, right? That was the wrong answer. That didn't work. I found fitness and fitness did work, right? Like I went from the guy who talks like this and couldn't look you in the eye and was like real <laughs> to somebody who could walk in a room and be like, I'm fucking Nick Bertuccio. This is me. This is what I do. And that's huge. What was your process like in learning all the fitness stuff? Like, did you, how did you learn all the things you know? Google, Google. originally. So hours and hours and hours as a kid, reading online, how to gain weight. You know, your typical, I don't know if you've read about this kind of stuff much, but there's a lot of bro science, they call it, sure. bodybuilding forums. You gotta train in the eight to 12 rep range. You gotta dirty bulk, you gotta do that. Like all the mass gainer shakes, all, all that stuff that was unsustainable bullshit. Sure. Mostly. How about more plates, more dates? So more more plates, more dates is fantastic. <laughs> I love him. Yeah. He's awesome always talking about testosterone regulation or what is he called? Optimization, testosterone optimization. Mm -hmm. He's a smart guy. He's fantastic, dude. Very intelligent guy. So he was one of the channels that I watched originally. Um, and it's kind of cool now to see how his channel's grown that it's not just about fitness. Now it's like a self-improvement channel in oh, general, everything now. which is very much the kind of direction that I eventually want to go with. I was talking before about how some of my stuff is like life coaching. So I look up to that guy a lot. I think he's sure, awesome. Sure. I mean, the mindset stuff with the stuff you're talking about is huge. Mm -hmm. right? And I'll always remember the time that changed my life in regards to mindset. Because I had gone to the rooms and done that stuff, but I didn't learn the mindset thing there. Really? If anything, I, and if anything, I don't like some of the mindset that some of the people say in the rooms. So I think it can be detrimental in a way. Well, they'll talk badly about themselves. Well, they'll say, I'm so sick, I'm this. And I'm like, you know, mm. I don't think I like that very much. And like, that's why I don't really do the AAN anything anymore. Because I didn't like some of that stuff that they were saying. Now, I would also say this. I was doing a network marketing thing. And this guy did a seminar, the How to Talk to Yourself seminar. Now, the network marketing thing I was doing was trash. But it introduced me to this. It introduced me to the How to Talk to Yourself guy. And he was just talking about the power of all the words that you say, all the things that you think, all the things you've been told consistently throughout your life, how powerful they are. And it changes your thoughts. And there's something called neuroplasticity. Mm. Right? It changes your brain, literally. And this is what I think everything that helps people touches on this part, right? Whether it's hypnosis or prayer. And that's a big thing in the rooms too, a higher power in prayer. Mm -hmm. But I, I think they all work very similarly, right? It's, all, it's a mindset thing. And maybe there is a, something greater than us out there too. Maybe it's an energy. Maybe it's a God. I don't know. I don't claim to know for sure. But there's something. There's something. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. But that mindset stuff the most powerful thing. And so many people, and as a fellow coach, you probably run into this too, but there's people, the first step after taking care of addiction and mental health is the mindset part, right? Because so many people, they don't got that mindset part down. And if they don't have it down, and sometimes they say they do, but they really don't. And mm. I'll take them through the rest of the process, but if they really don't have the proper mindset stuff going on, they don't have the proper belief in themselves, it comes up later. Absolutely. And they say, oh, look at you. Why aren't you doing this? Why Always aren't you doing that? The wash. And it's like, oh, I have this limiting belief about myself ultimately. And that's why I'm not doing X, Y, or Z. But I, luckily I tell people there's ways to get around it, whether it's you're listening to positive stuff mm -hmm. or you're, the other, thing that the other thing that changed my life. Scott Adams, you know who that is? No, I never heard of him. He's a guy who made the Dilbert comic strip. Okay. And then he was on the Tim Ferriss show. 
and he was talking about the power of hypnotism and self-hypnosis in particular. And he was telling Tim the story of he met a hypnotist that said, you know, try something out. Write something down 15 times. And so see what happens. Something you want, write it down. And so he got a little jiggy with it. And one of the first things he did was like, he was working in an office place and he was like, I'm gonna write down 15 times, I wanna sleep with this girl. And he did it. And this is before he was rich and famous, mind you. Mm-hmm. And, and he wound up sleeping with that girl. And then he said, you know, I'm gonna try this for something else. I'm gonna take this like master's test. And he said, I'm gonna, and he wrote down 15 times a day for a while, I'm gonna get a 94 on this test. And he goes and does his work and does the test. And lo and behold, he was like, you know what he said? I got a fucking 94 on that test. And he said, I'm not saying it, it's because I wrote it down 15 times, but I don't know if I believe in coincidence either. Mm-hmm. So that got me started on the path of like, you know what? The power of doing that, writing something down, seeing it, writing it, reading it, thinking it, mm-hmm. speaking it. Like that can be, it's the closest thing to magic I've ever come across. I agree. And some people recognize it, and some people don't. Some people just kind of poo-poo it and say, that's just pseudoscience ridiculousness or what's the other thing I like to call it? A grifter thing or a a charlatan thing, right? All those fill-in-the-blank words. That's new age woo-woo nonsense. There it is. There it is. That's the other phrase. The law of attraction. Yeah, I mean, the law, people watch The Secret, right? And I think I think there's some truth in all of that stuff. Like mm-hmm. I don't go like, I wouldn't say I'm obsessed with it or anything, but I do see the power. Mm-hmm. There's certainly something to it. Just like uh, the difference between a prosperity and a poverty mentality, for example, mm-hmm. where you see it clear as day out there when how people like use their time and their money. Some people are cheap bastards, and they think I got to be a cheap bastard or I'm not going to get my needs taken care of. I'm not gonna have the money to pay my bills. But on the other hand, some people have a prosperity mentality and it's like, I'm gonna be generous with my money and time because I believe that when I'm generous, the universe will take care of me as well. Now it's not to say you're doing it so the universe will take care of you, but you do it because it's also it's a good thing to do. Right, it's and not the condition, it's the belief is what yes. you're saying. And so, for example, the police people call me today, and, and they always try to get donations from me. And I think, and half the time I want to hang up on my these stupid bastards. I want to give them more money. But I'm like, you know, if I give money to the universe, it's never served me poor. I've never gone broke mm-hmm. helping people, so I'll often say yes. But like, that's how important the mindset thing is to me. And then, like some people, they just never get it, though. They'll never get to that point. But I I always try to tell them, and you probably do too, that there's a way to do it. There's a way to flip it. So what would you say your mindset techniques or how do you help people with their mindset? So a lot to unpack there. I'm going to touch on a couple things you said. So first of all, talking about the self-hypnosis thing, everything you were saying, you ever read Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill? So everything you were saying to me was auto-suggestion. Right, what he talks about in that book, it's all a suggestion. It's the power to change your underlying subconscious beliefs mm-hmm. by essentially beating something in there. Whether it's through written affirmations, whether it's verbal affirmations, talking in a mirror, whether it's thought affirmations, right? Like I do thought affirmations throughout the day, all day long. I think things that I want. I tell myself that I already have them. I'm a huge believer in that. And the more I don't mean, you know, kind of successful, this guy does really well, makes a million dollars a year, whatever. The more really mega rich, mega successful people, and successful in all areas, it's not just in, you know, finances. People you study and learn about, they all have that in common, Mm -hmm. right? They are all huge believers in the power of belief, right? And you talked about religion, Most religions come down to that too. Like what's the cornerstone of Christianity? I'm not overly religious myself, but faith, right? And most people, Christians, if you asked about that, would say it's faith in Jesus, in God, whatever. I'm I'm not, that's not me, so I'm not even gonna get into that. But it's 
It's faith, it is absolute belief that something out there has got you, that things are gonna work out for the best for you. And often it's true, right? Right, and it's true, and you could say it's true because you put that thought out there and the energy made it come back to you, or maybe it's more practical, right? If that's too woo-woo, new agey for you, to, that's not palatable, then maybe it's just that, you know, I made a video about this the other day, if you don't believe something is possible for you, right? You ever work in sales? Okay. If you're on a sales call with a prospect, right? And you don't believe that prospect's gonna buy, are you really giving your all to that pitch? Hell no. <laughs> you're just saying whatever you gotta say to go through the motions. You already have the, con like the conversation's already played out in your head. It's done. You're not getting that sale. But if you, on the flip side, before you take this call, say it was a referral from somebody, and whoever referred you to them told you, whoever referred them to you tells you, this person is definitely buying. Like I already talked to him, he really, he likes you, he saw your content, he wants your service. You are gonna go so much harder with that pitch because you believe it's possible. You know, you could relate that to sports, you could relate that to bodybuilding, to a business venture especially a business venture. You can relate that to literally anything. Your belief that things are gonna work out for the best for you, that things are gonna work, is probably the single biggest determining Number factor one. of whether or not they will work. Number one. And you know, whether that's because of the effort you put in impractical stuff or some energy vibration frequency stuff that we can't prove yet, who knows really who the hell cares? It's like the Tony Robbins sayings, the the attitude determines altitude kind mm -hmm. of thing, right? Absolutely. Oh. Or like you talked about, you know, like a higher power in the rooms. Like I have an understanding of a higher power now, right? It's energy. But I was hardcore back and forth atheist agnostic from until I came to the rooms growing up and all throughout addiction. And somebody pushed it to me this way one time. He was like, look, dude, let's say that there is something out there and all you have to do for it to have this massively beneficial impact in your life that it's having on all these other addicts' lives that are getting clean is hit your knees for 15 fucking seconds in the morning <laughs> and say, whatever's out there, could you please help me stay clean today? And then for 15 seconds before you go to bed at night, do the same thing. Whatever's out there, thanks for helping me stay clean today. Like, okay, worst comes to worst, you spent 30 seconds total throughout the whole day in the privacy of your own room where no one else can see you and it's not embarrassing talking to something that's not there. You probably spend more than 30 seconds a day talking out loud or in your head to yourself sure. or something that like, what's the difference? And if there is something there, that like, then it helps you. Like that's... How did you notice the effect in your life? Hmm. Or was there a time you could think and notice it and see the difference or feel the difference? In terms of like the higher With power the thing or the well, just that, belief in general? Both. With both. The higher power thing, I guess, I mean a lot more in retrospect, right? Like now I look back and I'm like, I should have died there. I should have died there. I did flatline there. I did like, clearly something was looking out for me. Crashed my car 30 times here and didn't have a scratch on me. Like, Let me pause you there real quick. So when you flatline, did you ever get any like uh, near death experience type stuff in there? No. And it seems like most people I talk to the flatline from heroin overdoses, nothing. Nothing. Just and you could, uh, and from what I'm reading, you know that could be that you know your brain activity is just totally shut down. So whatever biological processes, whether you believe like Rogan, it's an endogenous DMT release or right. whatever That's it what is, about to say. Yeah. whatever it is that that brain activity either doesn't happen because you know you're cut off from oxygen, That's whatever, or you're just too sedated to experience it or remember it or something, you know what I mean? So that's interesting to me, so that perhaps a drug like an opiate blocks the DMT release that would sometimes give people the NDE, the near-death experience. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the people that died from maybe other things, that uh, there's not like a drug interfering that they can get that still, Mm -hmm. Because they also say the NDE people, it's a lot like it can be a lot like a, a quote unquote alien abduction story a lot of times too. Mm -hmm. Rogan would have that guy on. I don't know if it was Graham Hancock 
or John Anthony West. I think it was one of those two, but he was talking all about that. But that was just my tangent about the death thing. So you notice the difference with the higher power. You notice the difference with the mindset. For me, the mindset thing was just noticing how many times I would tell myself I couldn't do something. And then as I started listening to the positive self-talk, I would say, you know what? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? And mm. that's another thing. Empowering questions were another thing I learned where when you ask yourself a question, you're actually, your brain's kind of forced to answer it, but you ask it in an empowering way. It's like, so for an example, I'd be like, oh, why do so many people like me? Or why do I think I'm really great? And then you, and no, you answer the question in your head a little bit, and it just gets you thinking in that different kind of direction. And I think it's, the mindset thing's part of my routine every day, right? And for some people, they need to crack, that's the first thing they need to do, is get that mindset thing. But sometimes I even forget about it until I'm in a conversation like this with you, where I'm like, you know, I forget, even though I do it every day, I can still forget like the importance of it. Absolutely, because you know? it's almost like you take it for granted. Yes, it's just a normal exactly. part of your routine. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So moving forward, though, with your coaching thing, do you have like a group of coaches and personal trainers that, that kind of work with you? or? Nope, just me. I network with a lot of other coaches online that do what I do just to talk everything from like content strategies, you know, lead strategies, right. just like general chop talk, like humor stuff. Um, time management strategies, you know what I mean? Because what kind of time management strategies you learn? Just trying to figure out how to block off your day, right? You know what well, I mean? A, like I have, like all my leads come straight to my phone, right? So th I don't have like a set hourly schedule that I'm working, and other than my tasks that I know I have to do each day, the rest of my day's schedule is. I mean, I make it. Right. But it's up in the air because I don't know when those leads are coming in and when those leads do come in, I don't know when we're going to be able to drive to set up that call as quickly as possible. And most people in my industry run their leads a similar sort of a way. Sure. Right? So trying to manage how you're going to make all that work, especially when you're working with people online, so it's all different time zones, can be very hectic to try to have a life very very outside of that. Yeah, you have to be extremely organized. So how do you plan your time? Do you plan it by days or by week? Or by the day. By the day? Mm -hmm. That's how often how I'll do it too. And I I used to be really into learning about how people organize their time. It's right? important. Some people would say the best thing to do is like two hour blocks and then like 30 minute breaks. And then other people would say you divide days in the month where you have a few different projects going on. Like the first 10 days of the month you do this project. The second 10 days you do this. The third 10 days you do that. I think a lot of this I got from Tim Ferriss, which I haven't been listening to as much of him recently, but he was all about the optimization, performance mm -hmm. optimization. Him and uh, Naval, I really started to like too. Do you know him? That sounds familiar. Ferriss, I know, but I, I'm not Naval is like an Indian one. guy. He's a, he's a wise guy. He's a wise, not like a good fellow's wise guy, but he's a wise, he has got a lot of wisdom. Okay. But what kind of uh, creators do you listen to? So, um, they really run the gamut from everybody who authors think like Eckhart Tolle, people right. like that, Goggins, you know, people that aren't so much content creators as much as they just, I guess you could think of Eckhart Tolle as a You read his book, Goggins? Mm -hmm. Can't Hurt Me, fantastic book. He's talking a lot about what the feeding your inner bitch in there, right? Mm-hmm. Rogan talks about that too. All right, so a lot of the people that I vibe with online have that kind of mentality. Think like Jocko Willink, think just radical self-responsibility, right? Like no one is coming to save you. Everything in your life is your fucking fault. Everything. And here's the, best the thing. Way to look at it. Somebody just heard this and is going to say, but, but, but my circumstances, but what about the starving children? But what about these hand, the, the hand you were dealt? Okay, let me rephrase that. Everything is your fault. And if it's not your fault, you better find a way in your head to fucking make it your fault because that's the only way you are going to regain control of your life and be able to solve the problem. Right. And you already know where this would get you into trouble. Like, 
on Facebook, I would see people would say, like, no. what about an assault? What about this? What, what about doesn't get you this? in trouble on Facebook? Right. I don't use Facebook any much, much anymore because I feel like it, people are just angry, negative, and miserable and looking oh, for somebody oh. to argue with. Because I think regardless of fault, I would say there's always something to learn mm -hmm. and an opportunity and a meaning you can assign anything that's happened. Mm -hmm. There's always something that you can do, or at least take a look at your side of the street. Even if it's 99.9% .9 not your fault, you can still take a look at your side of it and okay. say, is there anything I could have done differently? Mm -hmm. Because what else can you possibly say? When you blame others and you push it outside of your circle of influence, you've got no power left. You've, you've disempowered yourself. And I always say to people, you may as well take a look at it. And some guy the other day, he was, roast, he was trying to make me look bad, this bastard. But he's trying to say, oh, that guy Tate said that if someone gets sexually assaulted, it's somewhat their responsibility. Was this your Facebook status mm -hmm. that I commented on? Maybe it was that one. But someone was trying to get me to say, oh, I agree with Tate on that. And I was like, you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, it depends on the scenario. That's mm -hmm. like, like, sometimes... Maybe there is something that person could have done better. Right. I'm not it's gonna say 100 percent Scenario dependent. Yes. Every scenario needs to be taken individually. You know yeah. what I'm saying? In some of the scenarios, maybe there is something they could have done a little better. Am I gonna say it's their fault entirely? No. It's probably the other person's fault more so. But mm -hmm. there's still something to learn. There's still something that maybe they can do better. And, right. And that's the same thing if someone's a parent. It's like if you have a daughter, are you gonna make it so that they're going to get eaten up by the world? Or are you going to say, you know what? The world is not a perfect place. I want to empower my daughters to make it the least likely that something like that would ever happen. Because mm -hmm. it is possible to do that. right? I would say, you know what? Uh, make sure if you're going to be out at night and drinking or something, you have your girlfriends with you or someone with you. right? Don't go to strange dudes' houses that are drunk and that you don't know them. They're just you one-on-one -on -one because they're going to presume that's a, a sexual situation. Things right. like that. Where how it's about like, enroll your teenage daughters in jiu-jitsu? That would be great too. Muay Thai, jiu-jitsu. You do all the things mm -hmm. that could possibly make it less likely. Right. And you could say it's not the fault, but those things would make it less likely. Mm -hmm. And that's all, as a parent, that's all you can do. Right. You empower your daughter to say, you know what? We're going to make it so that this is the least likely thing because mm -hmm. we've empowered you. And I can already hear, I, so I can hear the backlash before it's even said to me. And I'm like, I know what they're going to say to that. They say, well, so you're saying the ones that did happen to, that they should have done better or their parents didn't do a good enough job? It's like, well, what's happened's happened. I'm not right. talking about the thing that's happened. I'm, I'm talking about what can we do moving forward. Right. Because that's like, all that matters. I like we talked about it being dependent on individual scenarios. Of course, there are always going to be situations where you could say it was not this person's fault. Look, you're sitting in your kitchen in Kensington or something. You're in this gentrified area yeah. and you got this nice place and a stray bullet comes through your window and just <coughs> done. Yeah, that does happen. Was that really your fault? Somebody could be an asshole and be like, yeah, you chose to sit there. <laughs> no, that's not your fault. All right. Nor is it the starving child across the world's fault that he was born into that situation. And nor is it some tons of assault victims, nor was it really their fault. No, but for most, if not all, situations in life, it's your fault. And if it's not your fault, you got to make it your fault to get your power back, right? Like, right. let's say you're a business owner and you, your employee makes a bad decision. You know, you're on vacation and the guy running your show totally fucks everything up. That's not your fault, right? Well, no, it is. You hired that guy. You didn't have the Extreme system. ownership. You didn't have the systems in place to fix this problem if it came up. That's it. Like it there's always a way that it's your fault. Yeah. Jocko would say, that's extreme ownership. Mm -hmm. I read his book, Extreme Ownership. And that's been the benchmark to me ever since about what's a good leader versus what's not really a good leader. The good leaders will take more of their fair share of the blame, less than their fair share of the credit, and they'll take responsibility for everything that happens underneath them. Mm -hmm. And that's a simple leadership tenets, those two things, that so many leaders don't seem to abide by. First and foremost, probably our politicians don't abide by that. But even just businesses, the businesses out there, they don't abide by that. Everyone's blaming one another, throwing other people under the bus. And I guess they think they have to do that. 
they'd have to do that or it'll be their neck on the chopping block. But I was like, you know, there's got to be a poverty mentality in there somewhere with the people who are doing that because I would say if you do the right things and you take more than your fair share of the blame and you take extreme ownership and it gets you in that much trouble, then you did yourself a favor if that, if you get removed from that scenario, that's a favor. Mm. That's a blessing. You go on to the next place. That's better. That's why I say when you act in the principles, the right things will happen. And sometimes it means leaving a situation. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, when I talk to people about radical self-respect, women or men both, and they're in a bad relationship, so many people come to, the, come to me with like the hope that they'll get together and things will get back and good with that person again. But it's like, well, mm -hmm. you got to understand that if you get better yourself, and you practice radical self-respect, maybe it means you should be going out the door mm -hmm. and not trying to solve it with this person here. Maybe that means you need to be going, it's gonna send you to brighter pastures. Right, like let's say, how about if you worked on yourself, you wouldn't want that person anymore because you would be like, I don't want someone who makes me feel like this. Right. Right, like that was I had plenty of my own experience with toxic relationships, and that was always my experience. Right, through all my years of self improvement with addiction, with fitness, with everything else, the journey that I've been on, every time I've been in a bad relationship, bad situation, it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship, it could be job, life situation, whatever, where I am accepting less than what I deserve, or not living up to my potential, or you know, whatever self-improvement was what showed me that I deserve better, that I could be doing better, that I that made me want better for myself. You know, like I can relate to that big time in a past relationship where this woman was cheating on me repeatedly and I thought that I was so in love with her, right? And after I worked on myself for a little bit, it really started to become apparent to me, like I started to really sit down and think about it, like, okay, what do I love about this woman? Crickets, like I couldn't figure, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was, what value does this person add to my life? And I don't mean what can this person do for me? I mean like literally what, what is the good here? Like there's none, like I, on some level I'm staying here because I think you use different terms, but like a scarcity versus an abundance mindset because my mindset was scarcity. You know what I mean? It wasn't, and most people, I think, whether they would consciously admit that or agree with that or not, if you're staying in a bad situation, it's not because you love that person so much. You might think it is, but I'd say 99% of the time, it's because on some level, you don't believe that you deserve better or yes. you don't believe you are capable both. of getting better or a combination of Often both. Often both. Uh, and well, a lot of people, their actions will ultimately speak the loudest. Mm -hmm. right? And they have all sorts of negative beliefs that keep them stuck in trauma bond type scenarios. They think, like they don't think they can do better. That's ultimately the bottom line of it, right? It's mm -hmm. like, it's either that or they're telling themselves, I just love this person so much that I'm going to stick it out with them. One of those two things. But now that we're on this topic, what do you think of the dating world out there today? That's a very generalized question. It's chaos. <laughs> well, a general question will give it's a, fun, a general answer. Um, it is very chaotic. I think it's, there's good and bad. I guess it depends on what you're asking that in relation to. Well, I guess just what are your thoughts on how has the dating market been treating you, I guess? I was in a very toxic, fucked up relationship for like five or six years. That I ended, think I know about this one. That ended a year, maybe two years-ish ago. It was off and on for a while at the end. But um, I took a very extended break from dating of all kinds after that. I went on a serious rampage afterwards for a while, you know, as I guess a lot of men do. Sure. And women, I'm sure, getting out of a toxic relationship Freedom. like that. You go wild for a minute. Let me download Tinder. Let me sleep with a bunch of people I have no business sleeping with. Let me just right. try to well, handle these feelings some other way. 
You know what I mean? And then I was like, okay. It was one of those toxic relationships where if you asked me or any of my friends, this woman was the absolute devil and she was the problem. And if you asked her or any of her friends, I was the absolute devil and I was the problem. That sounds about right. right. And let's be real, in any toxic relationship, it takes two to tango. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Well, like, I did a lot of toxic, messed up shit and so did she. What should I say? And no more Mr. Nice Guy. The guy says, Healthy people are not attracted to unhealthy people mm -hmm. in the first person. He goes, there's always going to be two unhealthy people in those scenarios, never just one. So all, like, I talk a lot about the relationships I've had on this channel before. And in all of them, I try to stress this, there was a problem with me mm -hmm. that I allowed myself to get into those things. Right, right and to I stay. playing the part. I was playing a role. They were serving some need in me I should have been feeling some other way. Mm -hmm. And I was to blame for being there to begin with. Now, people, before they have the awareness, I understand. It happens to everybody. But this relationship you're talking about, how did the toxicities come out? How didn't it come out? My God. <laughs> um, I think we were both very much growing into who we were meant to be with each other and we just want we're very different people and wanted very very different things in life but i don't know that either of us really understood that wow. and it was very much a situation where i think we both just kept clinging to what we knew and, you know one person would leave and then you know she would leave and then i would spend months trying to get her back and i finally get her back and then i would leave and then she would come back and it was just a merry-go-round. Yeah, it was a mess. Well, it was like a trauma thing, a little bit mm -hmm. of a trauma bond. But being on the same page with someone from the beginning, that's humongous, right? And then you got to know, as guys, you know, guys often put people in categories. Like, oh, this is a girl that I see a, a long-term future with. Mm -hmm. And then, unfortunately, sometimes guys put a girl in the, you know, this is a girl I just want to have fun with. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the girl knows that, and sometimes the girl doesn't. But that's the beginning, though. The beginning is, are you on the same page? Right, and that's really what's wavelength. important, right? I mean, you mentioned, I don't think that that's unfortunate if there's an open discussion about it. I think that's unfortunate if that girl doesn't realize. Yes. If she thinks I, there's a future there or a relationship yes, and Guy is just trying to have fun or vice versa. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's on what side of that equation, right? It goes both ways. But I think, you know, if you're up front from the get-go, man or woman, that look, I'm not looking for a relationship. Um, you know, I'm just trying to have fun. I'm just seeing what's out there. This is casual. Whatever words you use, I'm just trying to fuck. What I, you know, whatever your mo is. I think right. if you're open and honest about that, most people are going to respect it. Right. So you know, like I've had women that I wanted to date tell me, like, look, I'm gonna be honest, Nick. I like spending time with you. I like hanging out with you. I like fucking you. But I, there are other guys I want to see, and I'm not really into a relationship. And there have been times I've been like, nope, can't do that. And there have been times that I've respected that. I'm surprised and vice women versa. said that to you. And vice versa. I have said that to women who have been like, no, I'm not down with that. And I have said that to women who have absolutely respected that and who have told me, you know, I really appreciate that you were just honest with me and told me that. Like, no guy has ever been honest with me about that before. Oh, so the women said that about you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I think most men don't have the balls to say, like, hey, listen, well, you know, I really like you, but I want to sleep with other people. I know when you own it, things go a lot better when mm -hmm. you own something, right? Women, don't. what they really don't like is the lies. Exactly. They don't like the lies or deceits or the stringing along, which is often what a lot of guys end up doing, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, if someone says, especially now, people going into these ENM, poly relationships, whatever, people say, hey, this is what I want. The women generally respect that if you mm -hmm. just own it. And I'm also surprised the woman was so honest with you, that woman that was saying, you know, I like hanging out and hooking up with you with whatever, but I want to see other dudes. I'm depressed because you don't see that as much anymore from I, their side. Either. I was too. I had no idea how to respond to it. I think I kind of sat there with, emotional my, maturity. with my mouth gaping open for a second. Like, wait, you just said you want to, you, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, it definitely caught me off guard. But in retrospect, I was like, wow. 
I really respect that because I've also been in situations where I'm dating somebody or, you know, in the beginning stages of dating somebody, sleeping with them, whatever. And, you know, it turns out that I, they were sleeping with somebody else during that whole stage. And that, you know, just like most men don't have the balls to say this up front, they didn't tell me that because they were afraid that I would walk away. Because that's ultimately, you talked about the deceit, that's why most men would lie about that, right? Right. Because well, they don't want to lose. Yeah. Yes. And because and what? Sometimes they will lose it, though. Mm-hmm. They're honest. Sometimes they will go. Right. But, and, I mean, that's, that's honest. That yes. you are respecting that person enough. Like, you respect them enough to sleep with them, right? So you should respect them enough to give them the decision-making process of, hey, this is what this is. Is this what you want? Are you cool with this or not? If not, it's okay. We can be friends. Like, I mean, I would huge. always rather be told... A truth than being ghosted. That's my least favorite thing when women don't tell me what's going on. And that's happened before. Not not all the time anymore, but people would just you hook up and do whatever, you do that for several times, and then they just go. Mm-hmm. No, no, nothing. No and I would say, you know what? Tell me something. I don't care what you say. Just say something. And I would be a thousand times better off with that than saying nothing. I can't stand nothing. Okay. So the last time that happened, probably, I guess a little over a year ago that happened. But I always hate it, and it still sticks in my head, even though there's been uh, tons of girls I've dated since then. But that one that did that, I'm like, oh, I, I still think about that, that she didn't tell me anything. I think ghosting is a form of psychological abuse in most situations. It is, but using the mindset thing is like, well, what can I learn from this? It's like, I shouldn't right. let it bother me. It's like, it's just... It is what it is. I can't change that. Mm-hmm. I can't let how someone else views me affect my opinion of me. And all Absolutely. these all the other things you go through. Yeah, you it, can't be a victim about it. Right. But I'm just saying that like you said, that's still with you a year later. Like that I think about it. It does something to you. Like it it stays in there much longer than somebody just saying, Hey, you know, Jared and I'm just not into you, I'm sorry. Right. Like that you would have maybe been upset about for a week and then or it however, is, you know is. what I mean? But the ghosting, there's something different there, the not knowing. Yeah, that is what it is. It's the not knowing what the exact reasons were. Because like, like I said, if I could hear reasons, I'm totally good. Even if they're the worst reasons in the world, like, like, they could, maybe they would think it would hurt me. Because mm-hmm. that's how women think sometimes. I'll say, you know what? I didn't want to tell them the truth because I thought it would hurt them. Or, I thought, or they think their hamster goes round and round. And then when they finally talk to you again, if they ever do, I'm thinking, why would you think that of me? Like, but they, they get themselves in these corridors, I guess. They go down these rabbit holes of thinking that just don't even make sense. Right. So one girl said, for example, what the hell was she saying to me? She said something along the lines of, oh, I thought you were too far away, and so I decided not to talk to you anymore. And then That's she came back around, though, and I'm like, well... If that's what you were thinking, you could have just fucking told me that. It's like, mm-hmm. but instead she was like, no, oh, I just, I just didn't want to. So I think ghosting is rude. I mean, like most things in how we treat other people, right? It's a projection of how we feel about ourselves. So I think when you ghost somebody, like take that girl ghosting you with the example you just used, that to me says that she does not respect herself. Oh enough to show respect enough to another person, right? Because the amount that you can respect another person is going to be in direct correlation with how much you are capable of respecting yourself enough to have that difficult conversation. You know what I mean? Like if you are ghosting other people because you don't want to have that difficult conversation to tell them something that might hurt their feelings, that whatever, that's no different than you running from your own problems in your own life. Like that same girl probably ghosts all of her own problems. It's probably her preferred method of breaking up and probably her preferred method of the ostrich routine in her own life. Right, like right. not just with other people, but like with her own stuff. You know what I mean? Just literally running away from things. I think it's a reflection of that. Yeah, I think a lot of them, they just don't handle conflicts well. They don't handle the tough conversations well. But if you're going to be in a serious relationship... You got that, that's life. The tough conversations are what's important. You know, Tom and Lisa Bilyeu, impact yep. theory. Yep. Yep. So, like, they... What was the bars that they made? What do they call the quest? Is that what they did? 
Tom did the Quest bars. Yeah, I think he yeah. sold the company, but that was what got him initially right. famous. But they do a lot, so they have that, they have impact theory, which is like business, entrepreneurship, self-improvement, Tom's channel. But then they have a relationship theory where they do together oh, the okay, podcast. Yeah. And they, I think you would really like it, you should check this out. They delve into some really interesting topics. And one of them is how right from the beginning they had all these really hard conversations. And on a regular basis, they have really hard conversations. And I mean, that's so important because if you can't have a real conversation like that with the person you're with, you're holding a part of yourself, but like how full and transparent can you really be? You are keeping some 10, 20, whatever percent of yourself under wraps out of fear of how this person might react or judge you for it. Now let's use that same example and say it wasn't about a conversation. Let's say that 10 or 20 percent of yourself is that you're a I don't know, X con current con, you do the X fringe activity, you do whatever it is, you know what I mean? Your partner would probably think, and most people, if you ask them, would think it's really shitty for you to be keeping 20%, one fifth of who you are as a person from that partner, and that that's going to affect the relationship, right? So why would it be any different in this context? Well, it shouldn't be, but I don't think there's there's a lot of people that can't handle those kinds of emotionally mature conversations. Mm -hmm. It seems like it should be, it seems like it should be easier to find than it is. But it seems like there's a lot of people who can't handle that anymore for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's trauma, maybe it's mental health, maybe it's addiction, maybe it's just they never learned how. But it's difficult in this day and age in the dating world. So I'm a little older than you, I guess, but so with me, most people my age are together with someone, mostly, or maybe they're divorced by now, or they're a single mother or something. But it's tougher. It's tougher as you get older because I've made a video before about the over 30 dating world, and you see there's all sorts of you know, addiction issues in there, resolved and unresolved, mm -hmm. trauma resolved and unresolved, mental health resolved and unresolved. The personality disorder ones, they're the toughest because they're the hardest to resolve in my mm -hmm. experience. But it's just tough and it seems like it should be easier than it is. And I guess I feel bad for the younger people too because they're growing up on social media right now mm -hmm. and with Tinder, Bumble, Hinge, Facebook dating. And it can be a fiasco out there. I don't know, do you see a lot of people in your age group coming into serious relationships? Yeah. So they're working out? I mean, I think I'm, I'm 29, right? So I'm at the age where most of the people I grew up with are getting married, having kids. It's about that time, but mm -hmm. it's probably, would you say it's 50-50? Like 50% getting married, 50% staying single? Mm, nah, probably more, so more married? than that. Yeah, or not really? married, but in long-term relationships, okay. if not. That's surprising mm -hmm. to me. No, I, I mean, it really not. depends on the group. Too, you know what I mean? Like if I compare like the people I grew up with that I don't talk to really anymore, most of them are either have their first child, are married, you know, have a home with their partner, long-term relationship, etc. versus, you know, like the group of people I'm closest with today are all flight attendants. And, you know, some of them have relationships but more of them are single, and some of them are older than me. So I mean, a lot of it just depends on your lifestyle. I got you. Right? It's got to be an interesting lifestyle. The old flight attendant. Yeah, a very they interesting lifestyle. Travel all lifestyles. around the world, or I guess there's domestic flight attendants, and then mm -hmm. there's more international flight attendants, right? Right. So most of my friends work for American Airlines. So okay. It's international. So they go everywhere. They go everywhere. And they and get, they like get paid chill? extra for the international places. Okay. So they get to chill where they go in other mm -hmm. areas, though? And you can spend a little time and, I guess, enjoy the area? Dude, it sounds like the coolest job in the fucking world. Yeah, I would see that. I could see that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But speaking of that kind of thing also, what are your goals moving forward with your coaching business and the things you want to do? So... I am, it's not so much a goal, this is my reality. This will be a multi seven figure business that will be global. I'm going to change thousands of lives through fitness across the world. So for anyone that wants to reach you about this, where do they reach you about this? And you, do you have, like I, I asked you this before, but 
any sorts of people that you seem to help the best? So my website is BertuccioCoachingServices.com, but where most of my content is, is just my Instagram. It's Instagram at Nick Bertuccio. We'll put these in the descriptions of the videos too. Mm -hmm. So those two places. And I guess what I'm trying to get at here is the people that you think you'd be able to help the most. Mm -hmm. Where are they now or who are they now? So there are people who, you know, either used to be in shape, you know, maybe when they were teenagers and they're adults now, have gotten way out of it, or were never in shape but always wanted to be. The people who look at themselves in the mirror every day and don't recognize what they see, that mm. don't like what they see. The guys that keep their shirt on at the beach, whether it's because they're big or whether it's because they're small. Okay. You know, the guys who feel like they're not confident enough to talk to a woman because of the way they look. Or the reverse of that, the women who feel like there are no men interested in them because of the way they look. The people whose lack of fitness and body image is affecting their mental health. Yeah, that's a good summary That was it. my story, that was what fitness did for me. So that is the type of client that I like to work with the best. I mean, I work with, you know, about other bodybuilders and people like that too that certainly are very confident, even egotistical people that just want to get shredded. Right. And that's cool too. But what I like to do the best, like it's rewarding to help, you know, like you're in good shape. Like it's rewarding to help somebody like yourself, you know, get shredded or get an extra line in their abs, right? But not nearly as rewarding as helping, you know, the old me like I talked about earlier, the guy who talks like sure, this and sure. can't look in the eyes. You see a much and, bigger difference. Right, and he's messaging me talking about how much more confident he is in his life, how he asked this girl out on a date, how he, you know what I mean, he has more energy. He's it's like, that, that's huge. Like, at that point, the physical transformation, the picture, that's just a bonus. I got you. And what kinds of nutrition suggestions do you give people? Does it depend on their goals or so overall nutrition suggestions? So the specifics obviously depend on your goals, right? But what I do in my program is flexible dieting. So have you ever heard of macros? Yes. Okay, so macros, protein, fats, carbs. So what I do for all my people is I calculate the amount of those nutrients that they should be eating on a given day. So for some people, it might be the same thing seven days a week, right? Other people, you know, maybe you're more advanced, maybe your carbs are different on leg day versus arm day versus rest days. So you got How do you determine it? Based, what their macros should be? So it's based on their body weight, their height, their activity level, and their age. Okay. And obviously, you know, their goals. And as far as, like I'll explain a little bit of this for people watching who might not know, Calories and macros, right? You hear about people counting one or the other, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's a misnomer. They're the same thing, right? All calories have macros, all macros have calories. Every gram of protein or carbs has four calories. Every gram of fat has nine calories. So all the calories in food are already made up of macros. Counting the macros is just like taking the calorie counting a step further as far as what are the calories that I'm counting made of. So in terms of how the number on the scale is gonna move, that's the calorie count, right? You know, whether or not you gain or lose weight. In terms of whether or not the weight you gain or lose is muscle or body fat, that's gonna depend on the macro breakdown of the calories that you were eating, right. you follow so what me? what determines if you're gonna lose muscle before you lose fat? So protein intake and training. Okay. Right. So when you are in a caloric deficit, and I see this a lot with people, people come to me, they're like, you know, I just, I need to lose all this weight first and then I want to focus on building muscle. And they think that they just have to do endless amounts of cardio. The problem is if you're in a caloric deficit, whether it's because you're, you know, eating fewer calories or burning more calories through exercise or both, and you, that exercise is not resistance training. You are not giving your body a stimulus that it needs those muscles for the stress that you are repeatedly subjecting it to. The muscle is the first thing to go because from a survival standpoint, your body doesn't want muscle. That's not very metabolically efficient, right? right? From a survival standpoint, your body wants to hold on to fat. Sure. That's your storage for energy, right? You store much more energy in fat than you can in muscle. Muscle actually costs energy just to maintain. It's the opposite. So what are the Batuccio approved carbs these days? I know 
I also want to get your thoughts on the keto kind of stuff too. But yeah, I don't even get me started. Um, well, well, so I, with the macro stuff, this is kind of the cornerstone of what I do, and I made a video about this earlier. The carb sources, the sources for anything, don't really matter that much. Like, this is the easiest way to break it down. Let's say you came to me, you were a client. Let's just make the math easy, and let's say I told you you were supposed to have 100 grams of carbs a day. You're gonna feel best in terms of, I can never say this word right, satiety, satiety, in terms of how full you feel. Satiated? Satiety. You're gonna feel the best in terms of that, in terms of blood sugar levels, energy, eating, you know, oats, sweet potato, brown rice, complex carbs. But I guess you'd never recommend like processed, boxed carbs, I guess. Like, what I gold, I do like goldfish. Recommend that? No, but here's the thing with the macros. So at the end of the day, in terms of how your body composition changes, the same amount of carbs is the same amount of carbs, whether it's from a glazed donut, goldfish, or sweet potatoes. Doesn't matter if it's from high fruit or anything? Nope, does not matter whatsoever. In terms of body composition changes, 100 grams of carbs is 100 grams of carbs. You know what I mean? If you are having, if that's your target, 100 grams of carbs a day, and you have literally just 100 grams of carbs from a cup of high fructose corn syrup, that'd be gross to drink. But let's just say that your body composition changes are going to be the same as if you spread that 100 grams out over the day in sweet potato. But you're going to feel drastically different. I guess the difference is, for just use the metric 100 grams of carbs, Mm -hmm. one donut could be that. Right. But well, it that, could be like five bags of chips, maybe even, to get to the same amount. Exactly. As the one donut. And let's talk about how that's going to make you feel. That one donut is going to spike your blood sugar, and then an hour later, you're going to be hungry. You know what I mean? You're going to feel crappy. You're going to want more sugar. Now you've got like no carbs left for the rest of the day, so you're beat to bring your blood sugar back up, sure. and you're going to be hungry again. Versus, let's say you ate a carb source that had fiber. Now you're going to feel full for longer. Your blood sugar is going to stay stable. Popcorn is my thing for that. You know, the number two source of fiber is popcorn. Really? I'm not a popcorn guy. No, I did not know that. I need it because I got digestive issues. Okay. I was eating popcorn. And it's a good slow carb. Now, I guess if they butter it up too much, not as much. But the rest of it, it's a good slow burning carb that I've liked. Because I don't like too much high fruct anymore. Mm-hmm. I used to try to do the keto stuff, but my problem with that was my mood and my energy was always low when I was trying to do the keto stuff. You probably weren't doing enough healthy fats. Something, something. So Whatever I never was, recommend keto for people, ever. I don't think it's too sustainable, honestly. It's not that it's not sustainable. I think it is sustainable if you like it. And there are certain things, like there's a lot of evidence for autoimmune disorders, any disorder mediated by inflammation, ADHD, anxiety, depression, that it can be really beneficial for those things. But those last two, in my opinion, I'm not so sure that it's actually the keto diet that's beneficial or if it's that the subjects in the studies doing the keto diet were eating, you know, the fat sources they were eating were really high in omega-3s, and omega-3s high intake is shown to drastically improve anxiety see, and depression. The problem I would run into is whenever I was in the keto, the ketosis state, if I ever cheated, I would have like a day recuperation period mm-hmm. because my, my brain would like go back into sugar withdrawal again mm-hmm. every time I cheated. And unless I was going to just be flawless 100% of the time, I just got tired of dealing with it. And yeah. I said, you know what? I'm going to do mm-hmm. some some simple or some complex carbs every so often. And I was, I'm not going to worry about it. Like, yeah. I don't worry about it right now because I'm not, like, training, cutting to be a, in a UFC fight. Mm-hmm. I'm not getting up on stage to do some sort of fitness competition. If I was doing those things, I would have to do something, right? I would have to be extremely strict and dedicated with it but as i am now i just like being in good shape and i like my mood being as good as it can be Mm -hmm. so like i don't worry too much about it i have a just like three packets of sugar in my coffee and that's that's my high fruct for the day okay but i do have that every day and if you're joe rogan like oh how how could you have those three packets of sugar in your coffee every day you got to be keto you got to be no high fruct right it's like you know i don't Mm -hmm. care about that much anymore it just doesn't serve me. Mm. So I'll give myself three packets of sugar mm-hmm. in my 20 ounce Wawa coffee. And right? even from a fat loss perspective, keto is not better. 
Carbs are not the enemy. Carbs do not prevent you from losing fat. Like where did they get whole, all this from? That whole subject is, I'm not even sure where it started, to be honest, but all of it is just- Can you equate carbs to there's poison? There's no factual basis to any of it. Okay, when you're in ketosis, you are burning more fat for energy, sure. But you're not losing weight unless your energy balance is, you know what I mean? Unless you're in a caloric deficit. And let's be real, you're burning more fat for energy, but what are you eating? Nothing but fat. So what's the, like it, it's not really making okay. a difference. And your mood fluctuates. Most importantly, you need carbs for high intensity exercise, all right? Carbs replenish glycogen in your muscles. Without glycogen in your muscles, can you exercise? Sure. Are you gonna be able to lift as much weight for as many reps? Absolutely fucking not. Take any high level keto athlete and give him a bagel. I promise you just put 30 pounds on all his lift 60 minutes I, later. I can see that. Like so. absolutely. And what does that translate to? Increased performance adaptations and more calories burned. Yeah, absolutely. That's how I would go about it too. So since we're still in the summer here, I guess summer is technically for shredding, right? Winter bulking, summer shredding. What, uh, whatever people are trying to do. What are the shredding suggestions you give to people? So I guess it depends on how dedicated you are, like how far you want to take it, right? So I guess but maybe I think, guys want to have like a six pack maybe for the beach. Right, so you touched on this a minute ago. I would challenge people and yourself, like what you just said, you talked about how if you wanted to do a fitness competition or a UFC fight or whatever, you'd have to be super strict and super dedicated. Okay, to do one of those things, yes. But just to get shredded like a six pack, you, like it can be sustainable. And what I do with people with counting macros makes that sustainable, right? Because you don't have to have your meal preps all day on the go. You can buy shit at Wawa. You can buy this. You can buy that. All you have to be able to do is take out your MyFitnessPal and track the macros and know that at the end of the day, you just hit these target numbers. And if your numbers are calculated right, you will get absolutely shredded with those numbers. You could diet down for a bodybuilding competition. I know a guy who dieted down for a bodybuilding competition strictly doing it if it fits your macros diet. Like literally down to the week of the show, he was fitting McDonald's breakfast sandwiches into his <laughs> macros and the numbers fit, so it doesn't matter. So I guess there's this thing where people think the quality of the macros matters. It does for some things, okay. right? Like we talked about the sugar thing. You know, if you are, you know, a healthy guy, is that gonna make a difference? No, but let's say you're 300 pounds okay, now it's not just about, okay, you have 100 grams of carbs for the day, there's 75 in this donut, so I have 25 left. Well, okay, it might be a little different for you because you're pre-diabetic, so you should not be spiking your blood sugar like that. You need slow digesting complex carbs, or for you, maybe something like keto would be really beneficial, right? At least for a And in terms of fats, you know, all fats are not created equal. There's a huge difference between Fat from, you know, your bullshit 80% lean beef that you make a burger patty with, you know, and the fat in salmon. Huge, huge, huge difference, right? In terms of, in terms of body composition changes, no. In terms of calories, no. But in terms of how it's going to affect your heart, your lipid values, your brain health, all that stuff, absolutely. What's the difference? So in turn, well, omega-3s drastically well, reduce- omega-3s, right? Dressed, not just fish, fish, almonds, olive oil, there's sources besides fish, but you're talking about internal health versus body composition. So just to be clear, I'm not saying that, you know, forget healthy whole foods, you know, you can eat donuts and pizza and bullshit all the time. You just have to hit your numbers and you're gonna be healthy. No, I'm talking strictly from a changing your body composition, body fat, muscle, weight okay. standpoint. In terms of overall health, you need to eat your vegetables. You need to be hitting your micronutrient targets. You should be having a diet high in omega-3s. You don't wanna eat a lot of processed bullshit. Right. In terms of okay. digestive health alone, forget all the other stuff. Well, I think that's an important distinction that I don't think a lot of people make. Mm -hmm. Now, micronutrients, what are considered micronutrients? So micronutrients are, you know, your vitamins, vitamin A, B, C, okay. all that okay. stuff. 
Which brings me to the next part of the question, which is, are there any supplements that you recommend people taking? Is there any uh, Bertuccio-approved supplements? So it really depends on the person. I think everybody should take fish oil. I think I everybody should take a multivitamin because you're probably not hitting on your micronutrient bases unless you're eating, you're a vegan and you're eating the rainbow every day. You probably, <laughs> and even then you're still probably not. Like, and you don't have to buy Centrum or some $50 a month fancy name brand, the little $8 for a month supply of ShopRite multivitamin. It's just well, fine. I, I tell people to stay away from the gummies. What were you gonna say? Okay, I was gonna say, I think the fish oil matters between the milligrams of fish oil and the omegas. Mm -hmm. I know for me, I think I take 1,400 milligrams of fish oil and there's 1,000 milligrams of omegas in there. Mm -hmm. But when I take lower than those amounts, I certainly feel it now. Because mm -hmm. I take that 1,400 by 1,000, I take that three times a day. Right. So, so you've doesn't... gotten used to the benefits of it and you notice oh, you when those s benefits aren't there, yeah. Well, that's the double-edged sword with all supplementation to me. Mm -hmm. is that once you take it, you notice the benefits, then if you stop taking it, you feel, <laughs> it's probably mental too, of course, but mm -hmm. you feel the mental and whatever physical is really going on, right? And there is some. Mm -hmm. But I interrupted so, you though, so what other kind of supplements do you uh, so recommend? I take a smorgasbord of different supplements, but in terms of what I recommend to most clients. Well, it's all about um, what you take too. You talked about 5-HTP. So 5-HTP is something that I've experimented with, 5-HTP and L-tyrosine, um, in standalone and in combination with one I another take both of them. off and on for years, right? I was on psych meds, every one you can possibly imagine in the book um, up until, I don't know exactly how old I was when I got off, 22, 23. How did you get off of them? I cold turkeyed everything. And at the time I was on Effexor, which is one of the worst withdrawal symptoms. And I was on been, a high dose. Must have been pleasant. Dude, it was a year, a fucking year of withdrawal symptoms, of walking around and just randomly getting this, they call them oh, the brain zaps. I heard about Like that. you feel like you're just getting electrocuted out of nowhere. Like yeah, it would Fexor happen was, while I was driving, it was scary. Effexor is an SSRI, right? Or is so it an Effexor is an SNRI, okay. so it works on both serotonin and norepinephrine. I see. SSNRI, so I think they word it. Oh, I'm sure. I think, it's, I think it's, there's SSRIs Ooh. and SNRIs. I'm not sure I if think there's it two has, or not. I think it has, yeah, I don't know what the acronym is, but I know it works on both serotonin and norepinephrine. So I know there's a lot of people who struggle with getting off of antidepressants, regardless of whether it's an SSRI, SSNRI. Mm -hmm. and they struggle for a while, like you're saying. So do you There's have any no suggestions joke. for them? So in a situation like that, you know, your neurotransmitter precursors can be hugely beneficial, you know, in terms of researching, okay, what is it that I was taking? And here's the problem with a lot of those drugs is that most people don't know if they're on an SSRI or an SNRI. They should Or know. I'm on Wellbutrin and this is about dopamine or this is you know, an atypical, this is a tricyclic, this is, right. most people don't, they're just like, my doctor said this is gonna make me happy. <laughs> and I'm not saying, you know, you should take this, you shouldn't take this, I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to your doctor, that's, that's not where I'm going with this, that's not my place to say, it's an individual discussion. But for me personally, I would never go back to taking that shit. I don't care how depressed I found myself. I don't care if I'm suicidal. <laughs> I would fucking never, I ever, don't blame you. ever go I don't back blame to you. taking that shit because if I really reflect on it, I don't think that it helped me. I probably didn't. I really, I don't, I don't believe that it did. And I think, think kind of like what you talked about. There are some people it helps, I think. Uh, look, there are people that it helps and I need to make an important distinction here that when you're talking about psych medications for disorders like bipolar, you know, particularly with like manic episodes, sure, sure. totally different story than just right. treating for depression alone. Or if you're talking about schizophrenia or anything involving hallucinations, delusions, anything of that sorts that's a serious distortion of reality, completely separate discussion. I'm talking just depression and anxiety here. But for me, I don't, I don't think that they really helped. And kind of like you talked about with the 12-step stuff, with the mindset, I believed that I needed them and I was sick. I'm depressed. Yeah. I need this medication. This is my label. This is my identity. This is what I struggle with. I'm an addict. I'm sick. I can never do X, Y, Z. I'm permanently going to have this. 
I am stuck in this box and it cannot change. That ideology is fucking poison, no matter what you fill the box with. Addiction, depression, like those labels are fucking poison. Sure. I you know what I mean? Like you talk about the placebo effect, that, that goes in reverse too. Like, okay, if you take this pill and you genuinely believe that it's another pill that's gonna help you, it's gonna have the same effect. If you genuinely believe what you're told by this program, this doctor, this whatever, that you have this affliction and this is the way it affects you, that's gonna manifest for you. Right. I think everyone should do their research and due diligence mm -hmm. on the things they take that their psychiatrist or their doctors prescribe them. I think way too many people just take whatever they're written and then don't even do much about it. They don't mm -hmm. look into it. They don't think about it, and they just said, oh, the doctor said it, so it must be good. And honestly, that I, I wish I could tell people that's always true, but it's certainly not always true. It's like, you mean to tell me that it's good for a psychiatrist to uh, prescribe two milligrams of Xanax a day, or Klodopins, or Adderall, or fill in the blank? It's like, it's not always going to be good, mm -hmm. right? Those things can be pretty damn harmful. Now, I'm not saying they should never be prescribed, but... Long term, there's not really too many good outcomes with them, mm -hmm. you know? And I think a lot, of, and part of the problem with the mental health thing is it takes a while to really kind of know yourself and understand yourself too. Like now I feel like I'm the expert on myself. So if any doctor would try to say anything to me now, I wouldn't even really believe them. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would even maybe believe is if they run like blood tests on me and they say, oh, your liver uh, peptides are up, or your enzymes are up. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll believe you then. Mm -hmm. But as far as like what is good for my mental health, I wouldn't trust a word they say. I wouldn't trust them as far as they can throw them. Because all they we used to do is throw meds down my throat too. They give me antipsychotic, or they give me SSRI, or Suboxone, or fill in the blank. But it's the thing is, and everyone always says, sleep, diet, exercise first, right? Mm -hmm. But that's hard even too for a lot of people. Like that's, just doing that first step is hard. Mm -hmm. Now people like you and me are in decent shape, so it's easier I think for people like us, but there's people who are, are maybe struggling with obesity, not as easy for them, or other kinds of thyroid or hormonal issues. That's another thing, that's also a whole other ball of wax. need it even more though, you know? Right, and they do need it, but it's like, and then they say, it's not, it's just not always easy to treat it, but once you get to understand your body a little bit and you know yourself a little bit, then all of a sudden you can kind of tell like what's working for you and what's not working for you. Mm -hmm. But I can't deny that does take a little while. It did take me a little while at Of least. course. And I had to do a lot of trial and error in there. And some of that trial and error was pretty painful. Mm -hmm. And that's where the doctors and the professionals would say, oh, well, we can't let people be doing that kind of trial and error. They'll hurt themselves. It was like, well... Maybe some will, but I think the rewards and the benefits are worth it on the other side. I wouldn't trade the path that I've taken for anything. Mm -hmm. It was painful. There was a lot of shit in the road. But for how I am now, I'm glad I got here. Uh, I don't need to rely on a psychiatrist. Like Everything I do, I'm able just to either buy at Vitamin Shop or GNC or online somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And, and most of it, it's just the basics, like zinc, magnesium, B vitamins, vitamin D3, a good probiotic. Mm -hmm. mm. And uh, Last one, super important. Oh, they make a massive difference. Mm -hmm. But you know, this is the kind of bullshit they do. You ready for this? I was listening to the radio the other day, and they were talking about how, in particular for women, that vitamin D has no effect. And they said, no effect, and it can actually contribute to, like, cancer or contribute to some other BS. And I'm like, says who? Says some study that was probably paid for by Big Pharma to get the worst possible results they could find. That's probably what it was. Or more likely, supposedly says some study that doesn't actually says that at all, that some asshole that runs that radio show ran three lines of and interpreted as that and then regurgitated well, that nonsense. Depending on who's paying for the study, they could try to find any sorts of things and mm -hmm. they can make the data look any sort of way because who's going to question it? Mm 
Right. Who's going to go and read the actual study to see how it was done? What was the variable? What was the control exactly. group? Exactly. That radio dude did not do that. But somebody no. like you that reads studies can see through the lines a little bit more there. I was just annoyed that they were, I heard them smearing vitamin D and I'm like, how can you possibly say vitamin D is going to be a bad thing? Like, and, and the same thing with just being in the sun in general is pretty good. I've been hearing people talk about how suntan lotion is not good for you right now. And I can believe that. It's like, because how did the world, how did humans exist all of history before suntan lotion? <laughs> I just had this kind of so like the other day. When did suntan lotion become a thing? The 60s? Yeah, like what? I mean, people were just running around with horribly sunburnt skin for yeah, it's like, how did they live? tens of thousands how of years. How did they survive? But they did, though, right? Mm -hmm. And so we've, I think there's all sorts of things they do to us in America here, and just the world in general now, that are just not necessary. And a lot of these drugs that people give, People don't understand, most of these drugs that have been made in the laboratory, this is all new. This is less than 100 years old, most of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So this is still an experiment, right? There's this, we're still experimenting in all of this stuff. And I think back to the basics. The basics are big. I agree, very so much. Keep it with the basics. So though you mentioned those not so much the magnesium or the individual vitamins, but for most of my clients, like I have a note file that I send them, I recommend that everybody take sugar-free Metamucil at night before bed, whether you're trying to Was gain weight or you're trying to lose weight, it's uh, psyllium husk. So it's just fiber. So one, it's gonna help improve your cholesterol. But two, more importantly, people don't really think about this. So I get not only weight loss, but a lot of like skinny guys and girls that are trying to gain muscle and bulk up which involves eating food constantly. Right. If you're not shitting every single day or multiple times a day, how easy do you think it is to keep putting all that food in? Oh, by the right, way. like that fiber intake is extremely important for people so and it has a beneficial effect on your gut microbiome as well. So to rewind, you say sugar-free Metamucil? Mm -hmm. What other digestive system uh, suggestions do you have? So I take digestive enzymes with every meal myself. I have something called gastroparesis, so my digestion is pretty messed up. Um, so digestive enzymes, what are those? The, literally, the, so the same enzymes that your pancreas would produce. Is it like a medicine, or what is it? Is that a no, supplement you Over-the-counter supplements. See? Okay, I've never even heard of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the client I use is, um, what the hell's the brand? Now Foods. Okay. Super enzymes, you could get like 180 of them on Amazon for like 15 bucks. I take one right before I take my food, right before I take, right before I eat my and food. What does it do? Help you break it down? Better? It helps you break it down. It drastically reduces bloating, especially if you're okay. eating some bullshit that you shouldn't be eating and you take two or three of them before a couple slices of pizza. It's like you had something that wasn't pizza. You go into the beach or something, like it's, it's huge. I'm surprised I've never even heard of these. Mm, massive. Massively helpful. And it helps um, the digestive system too. So it helps the digestive system. So beyond that, I found out about this originally from the bodybuilding world because it increases nutrient assimilation. So oh. in particular, protein. Right? You ever heard about somebody, I uh, ever heard of the correlation between pineapple and protein? Or like no. bodybuilders doing anything with no. that? So pineapple contains, amongst other enzymes, bromelain which is something that helps your body break down. It's also anti-inflammatory and a bunch of other stuff, but it helps your body break down and assimilate protein. So there are times where, you know, if I'm on the go all day and I can't get to, I take like 300 grams of protein a day. So that's a lot of meat, right? That's a lot of fucking food. If I am not eating a meal with eight to 10 ounces of chicken like every three hours, that's not easy to pull off. Right. So sometimes if I'm on the go all day, I have to stop somewhere like Smoothie King and make a crazy concoction. And I have them put anywhere from 90 to sometimes 180 grams of protein in one smoothie. You have to take a shitload of digestive, en digestive enzymes with that to be able to utilize half of that. I was gonna say, because I guess you don't subscribe to the, there's two, once you get past a certain amount of protein, there's no. diminishing returns. I've heard that an amount was 30. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? Yeah, I've heard you can only process so much at once. Right. I've never seen any so you take scientific 10 times basis that. to that. I don't know why people think that your body is just gonna excrete amino acids for no reason that it doesn't need. That's not, your body always needs amino so you acids. Say it's made of amino take acids. Take as much protein as you would like. Protein is by far the most beneficial macronutrient because it has the highest, what's called the thermic effect of food. 
meaning it requires the most energy to actually break down and digest. It burns calories to digest protein. Um, in terms of satiety, it's gonna help you keep full for longer. And most importantly, it is the hardest macronutrient for your body to store as fat by far. Okay. And do you need these digestive enzymes to process the protein properly? Or is there other things you need to take? So no, you absolutely don't need it, but it helps. It's going to improve it. So it's optimization, not a need. Okay, so the enzymes will help If you're having a shake with 180 grams of protein at once, you need that to not be sitting like this for the next three hours. Yeah. Okay. So any other supplements? So you have the digestive enzymes, the sugar-free Metamucil. A good probiotic. Fish oil, a good probiotic. A multivitamin. A multi. Anything Those else? are probably your basis, just cover your general health basics for everybody. So I'm sponsored by a supplement company called Blackstone Labs. They make a product called Glycolog that I, it's mandatory for every single one of my clients. What's a Glycolog? It's glycolog. So it's an insulin mimetic. So Promo code Patricio? Nicholas Patricio <laughs> Fit okay. gets you 20% <laughs> off. Yes. You put that, we'll put in, the that in the description too. So Glycolog is something that you take with carbs. So it's a serving size is three capsules. You don't have to take the whole thing, but it's designed three capsules to every 50 grams of carbs. So you literally swallow the capsules and you eat your food. And what it does is it increases insulin sensitivity and reduces insulin resistance. So it's a nutrient partition. What are the agent, symptoms of both of those? What's the symptom of insulin The easiest way to think about it is the reverse of that is diabetes. Okay. So, you know those guys that can just eat whatever the hell they want and it seems like they never gain weight and then other people it's like they eat, you know, they look at a donut and they get fat. So there's a lot of things that factor into that. But generally it's about insulin resistance. And the people that can eat whatever they want and never gain weight are your typical like super, super skinny slender guys, right? They have really high insulin sensitivity and really low insulin resistance. Okay. So when they consume carbohydrate, any kind of food really, but especially carbohydrates, much more of that is getting processed and ending up as muscle glycogen than being stored as body fat. I didn't know that. So what glycolog does is it increases that process on a per meal basis. So it's designed to take two servings a day with your two biggest carb meals, which if you're doing things correctly, should be your pre-workout meal and your post-workout meal. Every single client I put on it tells me immediately that they feel a difference. Like they're like, wow, I was so much more pumped during that workout. I don't feel as bloated from the carbs. I feel tighter the whole rest of the day. And after you're on it for a month or two and that insulin sensitivity increases and the resistance goes down, you notice it doesn't matter if you're trying to lean out, if you're trying to gain weight, your body processes food better. And this is called what again? Glycolog. Glycolog. What are you trying to do to me? Add more money onto my already extensive supplement routine? That's exactly what I'm doing. The glycolog and then the sugar-free Metamucil. <laughs> oh, and the digestive enzymes. There's three more things we're going to need. Uh, Metamucil and the enzymes probably cost you 20 bucks. but Okay, that's doable. But I take a lot. And my bill is pretty steep already. I'm right there with you, man. Believe but me. <laughs> it's mandatory, though. Because mm -hmm. I, I, my old philosophy with this part is I rather feel my best. It's not about, I want to get the, the most out of my years, right? You want to get the most quality years as opposed to the, the quantity. Mm -hmm. it's like you'll get quantity too, but I don't care about that as much as I can. Quality is much more important. The quality, right? Again, like living the best I can now. Mm -hmm. So that glut, the insulin one I want to do, digestive enzymes, and the one at night time probably too. Mm -hmm. But to circle back, to circle back to your seven-figure business plan, mm -hmm. what do you think is the next steps for you to be going down that path? So continuing to grow my social media presence is probably the biggest thing. You know, talking to other coaches that are much further along in that aspect than me. And tell me that that is by far yeah. the most important. Good mentors are key. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's, I mean, it's a content production standpoint. You know what I mean? It's figuring out, it's looking at the analytics and all the content you post and seeing what does best, feedback from people, and just catering to who you serve. Absolutely. And ultimately doing good work, right? You know what I mean? Like a lot of my clients 
come from my other clients. They have, they have such a good experience that they refer other people to me. I'd say at least half of my clients are referrals yeah. from other clients. You ever read that book, Endless Referrals? No. You probably want to check that one out. But it sounds like you're already doing a lot of it anyway. But often the best advertising is word of mouth advertising and, and showing your product or what you're offering is actually working. Mm -hmm. And especially with what you're doing, there's tangible results. You mm -hmm. see it, right? You see it physically in how someone's body is transforming. And that's marketing in and of itself right there. Absolutely. It's huge. Absolutely. I think a big part of it too, so something I used to do, I used to do everything in a spreadsheet. That's a traditional coaching way. But back in March, what I started doing was I got this app that I do all my training plans through now. So it's really cool. It allows me to, obviously everybody's workout program is custom, right? It's not like cookie cutter stuff like some people do. But what it allows me to do is have almost like a one-on-one -on -one personal training type of vibe with the client, even though I'm not there. So okay. like let's say you were on this program and I programmed you a workout. It literally comes up each exercise you're supposed to do, you know, set one, X reps, X weight. It shows your previous best there, has a timer for your rest periods, has videos, multiple videos with instructions for each exercise, substitutions for each exercise, syncs with your MyFitnessPal, all the food, all that kind of stuff. So I think that integrating technology in a way that other people in my industry don't do, I think that that is one of the key things with growing. I could see that. I think that's the one issue, right, when people try to learn from others. If they don't try to be a little innovative about it, they're not going to even get to the same point that the people they're learning from to got, mm -hmm. right? In order to really get to the next level, there's got to be something different or something unique about what you're doing, something innovative. You know, in the business world, they call it the blue ocean strategy, where you go in places that no one's gone before. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Apple did, honestly, with like their innovations with the iPod way back in the day. Like They weren't the first to market, but they did things innovative, where they made things that were already out there better. And I think there's a lot of this going on in our space, really, whether it's the life coaching or personal training, where it's like, if you're just trying to mimic someone else's way, you're probably not even going to get as far as them. Mm -hmm. But if you integrate like your own personality and your own positive benefits and your own assets into it and do something a little different, boom, mm -hmm. that's how the new growth will happen. All right. Well, especially when you're talking about an online-based business, like a coaching, right? People don't buy, like I used to have a separate Instagram page for my business, a Bertuccio Coaching Services page. I got rid of it and just started doing everything on my personal page because people don't buy from businesses, especially when you're talking online. People buy from people. That's true. People don't want a coach that some, the, the Phoenix logo, Bertuccio Coaching Services. They want to see the videos of, they want to know the person who's coaching them. You right? know, like that's you're massive. Right about that. Because I've split my Instagrams before, where I had a radical self-respect Instagram, mm -hmm. and then my just personal one. The, the business one, the brand one, that didn't take off as well, mm -hmm. you know? And I guess some people with Instagram now, you see like a nature is brutal Instagram account that'll really blow up, or these other reels. But they're still, the ones that really do the best, like you said, they are just the people. Right, because are those accounts person. really selling something though, or are they monetizing based on views and ads? Probably just the monetization. Yeah, I think if you're selling ads. a service and you're really doing well, you're 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 selling yourself most right. likely. I mean, like, I'm sure it's dependent on the service. But well, you're right. I mean, like it's like a Tim Ferriss, Tony Robbins, all these coaches. They don't have a business. No, their brand doing. is their name. That's their brand is themselves. Right, and that is something I'm incorporating too. Where it's like, oh, just have your name. Like in my YouTube channel, the name's here, mm -hmm. and it's important. You got to have that. And I try to talk about you know a good channel to watch about brand. Uh, building your brand. Vanessa Loggins, I think her name is. She's an, like an Asian woman. But she's given me a lot of good recommendations about like good thumbnails, how to create, all, have an abundance of content ideas. Mm -hmm. And she was, at, and honestly, and honestly, I was listening to her and she has like over 500,000 subscribers. At first I was annoyed. I'm like, this freaking girl doing this was better than me. 
And I was like, all right, Jared, you got to get past this jealous discomfort feeling mm -hmm. and learn from her because she's actually giving you some good pointers here. You got to get past yourself a little bit. And I did. I, and it, was, it was funny to feel the resistance in me as I was listening to her. I'm like, oh, this girl. And, but and I listened. I was like, okay, there's actually some good suggestions here. Mm -hmm. I can see maybe why she's grown and I got to get better. But I notice that in myself sometimes. There's, there's, that's a limit, right? That's a jealous circle. And I find that a lot with competitive people. Competitive people, they're in competition, right? And they, it's the, if you ever read, what's that book? Seven Habits of Highly Effective I'm People. I'm actually reading that one right now. How yeah. about that? So he says in there, you want to have a win-win mentality, right? But a lot of times competitive people, it's a win-lose. You win. And then that would the other person loses. Like right. in sports, that's what it is, right? Tom Brady, he's the ultimate win lose person. Right. But, but it works. Not for shaking him. Foles' hand, right? Yeah, well, that's what he is. I mean, I like Tom Brady, but I also know he's certainly a sore loser. Mm -hmm. Same with Bill Belichick. But Vince Lombardi said, you know, you want to know. He goes, I'll show you a good loser, and I'll show you a loser, is what Vince Lombardi said. And I can see it. Because yet they hate losing mm -hmm. just as much as they like to win. But in our sphere, the win-win thing is a little more beneficial. Absolutely. Right? But it's harder to get to that point, especially if you're used to the competition from sorts, because it usually is. There's a winner, mm -hmm. and then there's a loser. Right, and right? our ego doesn't want to take... No. Oh. You know, especially in the coaching business, right? But you can use that, I think. Like, when I feel that, it's not so much a jealousy thing, but I think it, it's just a resi it's an ego thing. It's a resistance huh. thing. Like on some level, I want to be like, no, I fucking know everything. I don't need this shit, right? Like that, to just being honest. I don't know everything, but sometimes I feel like I do, and I can have resistance right. to that. And like you said, I have to be like, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Nick. Forget about the messenger. Listen to the message. Yes. You know, and that can be really valuable as a coach because... How often do you think you're talking to clients and they feel like that about you and what you're telling them? Um, Especially male clients, like right? Because as often. men, we often do not want to take advice from another man. Especially if your nature is competitive, right? Like that takes a level of humility to be like, okay, I can listen to this guy. I can go to this person for help. I can take advice from him. That does not mean he's here and I'm here. Like maybe he just has more experience over here and I've been, I've explored more over here. Like it. It doesn't necessarily mean better or worse, but our ego wants to right. take it that way. And in terms of the success thing, that comes back to scarcity versus abundance, right? It's, you know, scarcity mindset is that girl, she's got this big piece of the pie, her 500,000 subscribers, that takes away, now there's less pie for me. Yeah. Versus an abundance mindset is she's got a big piece of the pie, awesome, I hope she gets a bigger one, the pie is infinite. Very true. You know? So what, because um, you see this as much as I do probably, but there are a lot of men that don't gravitate as much to the self-help space. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it's the reason you just said. So I guess just to brainstorm here, what do you think would be good ways just to get men to work on themselves? Because it's tough. It's tough to do it without injuring their ego or coming off like you're better than them or something. Mm -hmm. So what do you think could be some possible ways to get that done? So from a coaching standpoint, you mean like yeah, as the I mean, coach, I think one of the biggest and most powerful things is reframing your you statements to I statements. I like if there we. was, if like there was we. I or we, one or the other, something where you are, I you're putting yourself in the same category. Yes. You I make I mean? sure I do that. That's I do the hugely difference. important when you're trying to give somebody information that might damage their ego, but have them still receive it well. Cause that's an art. Sure. Right. Being able to give somebody information that you know is going to damage their ego, but deliver it in a way that they receive well, that is absolutely an art form. Because you know as well as I, women are more likely to try to better themselves. Mm -hmm. they, might, they might not be as good at it sometimes, but they're going out there. You know, they're going out there trying to improve themselves, listening to the self help folks, reading books. Mm -hmm. And I would say more women do that than men do that, it seems. Because I still think there's this. And I think it's getting smaller, but there's a lot of men who just don't think it's cool mm -hmm. to like be into self-help or something. Well, I think, go on, I'm sorry. Well, I think it's often though because 
you know, you've had addictions, I've had addictions. It changes your perspective when you've had to really kind of bottom out like that. And mm. so when you're building yourself up, you get used to learning new things. You get used to being a little more open-minded and just growing and learning. But people who haven't gone through those things, I don't think it's as easy for them. Mm-hmm. But what were you going to say? People that have never really been humbled by life. Is that what you're there, saying? There's a lot of them, yeah. Right? Like when you really get humbled, now you there's you only got up. Yes. Right? So I think that plays a part in it. Well, there's benefits. You know, there's benefits when you fuck up a little bit and then you have to pick up the pieces. The process of picking up the pieces, there's growth in that. And then there's more growth in actually taking each new step and doing it from the bottom as an older person because you're thinking about it in a way that others didn't have to because maybe they did those very same things when they were younger. Mm. They were younger and so it was just second nature and maybe their parenting helped or whatever it was. They didn't have to go through it. And like for me, it always seems like every little bit of growth that I get, I have to willingly do and consciously do. It's I'm never like bring that shit out. Yeah. Of course, it's never like I just kind of grow naturally, like it seems like some people do. And maybe that's just my wrong perception, maybe. But it seems like any bit of growth that I do, I have to consciously say, okay, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do better in this area. Was it always that way, or are you saying it's that way now? It's always been that way. Oh, okay. It's always been that way. Where, But I like it, though. I like the reading of new books, and I like going through those kinds of steps. And, I can't, and what I see it as is this. I see it as... That's part of the reason I can do coaching the way I do and teach people radical self-respect because I've had to go through very consciously all of those things, which makes me a good coach, right? Mm -hmm. If I didn't have to go through every step consciously and painstakingly, maybe I wouldn't be that kind of person that can help others. That's been the reframe I've chosen for it, right? And so in that case, I'm glad that it's happened that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's choosing to make it a positive, yes. right? I think in terms of you touched on the difference between men and women in regards to like the self-help, self-improvement sphere. I don't know if I agree with that. I think that you might be more men. I think yeah, and that could just be Maybe. you know selection, you know the, the slice of the population you take it from. Um, but I think that. I don't know if there's necessary more, necessarily more of an innate desire in either sex for self-improvement. I think it really depends on the, what's the word here, archetype, kind of, of man or woman you're talking about. Like, it sounds like the type of man you just described there, like, okay. what I heard when you said that was almost like, toxic masculinity like i'm not stupid <laughs> self-help books <laughs> give me a beer like that right. that was the image that flashed into my head the kind of archetype okay. when you said i'll give that. you this i'll give but you but there are lots of men out there like us who very much read books like that who want to be the best person that they can be who you know what i mean and those are the the men that right. that go up so i'll give you this so and you're right in this regard because that what what i said there not very scientific but here's the thing there are women on YouTube who are women dating coaches for men or other just women in general that are talking that they do have a large male audience. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a portion of men who maybe just struggle with masculine energy. And so mm. they gravitate towards a woman dating coach. For mm-hmm. an example, a Courtney Ryan. Now, and granted, she's pretty and I'm, I'm sure that's helped her success. But she's got like over 400,000 subscribers as a dating coach for men Mm -hmm. as a woman. And so what I would always say to men is, you know, unless a woman's a lesbian, she doesn't have any experience dating women. So you might want to take that into consideration. But it might make me seem jealous or whatever. But like at the same point, it's like, well, guys, chances are you're maybe struggling with masculine energy and you need to be around other men more and maybe that would also make you more attractive to women too Mm -hmm. but they they go off to that easier softer way with the girl and it's like i it's it's rampant because you're right there are a lot of guys going for the self-help but maybe they're just not going for it in the ways that i think would be most beneficial to them how about that that's fair 
So the woman being a dating coach for men, for men, that's... Look, I'm not one to say that you shouldn't do this or this isn't good because you're this gender or whatever. That, that's not me. But in my experience, and this is going to piss at least one person off watching this, women have no fucking idea <laughs> what they want in terms of... I mean, think about it. If you go up to any woman in this place right now and asked, what do you want in a man? How many of them are going to say, I want someone who does all the things that are going to get you friend-zoned? Every one of them will say that. Like, that's just, like, they, most women... Because they don't understand. They, no. But here's what they always say, that what happens is, the woman will say things that she wants the guy that she's already really attracted to, to do. Right, but I think that a lot of women don't understand that if the man that they were so attracted to really did these things, they would lose respect and attraction for them. And this is not to say that... You know, the stereotypical conversation I think that is had around this subject of like, you got to be an asshole and nice guys finish lead. That is not at all what I'm saying. I don't buy into that. I think that's fucking bullshit. However, you know, a lot of women will tell you, you know, I want a guy who is going to show up to the date and he's going to get me flowers and he's going to do this and he's going to do that and he's going to text me all the time and he's going to make himself super available and those are all things that are going to destroy. They think they want those things. Yeah, no. I promise you every woman that says that has two or three men in her life doing those things that she's like, oh, he's just a friend. He's like a brother to me. And they're like, when is this girl going to sleep with me? I've been buying her flowers. I've been telling her how beautiful she is. Right. And this is why. And then those men end up resenting women instead of just realizing that they've been sold a lie based on Disney movies and that that this this isn't just what. But this is why men need to talk to other men because other men who are successful with women, they know that, right? And it's not the guy even either that's been in one long-term relationship for ten years, but the guy who has been successful in the dating world. He knows more about women than the guy who's just been with one woman for ten years. I would say. Mm-hmm. Right? He knows how that game works. Right. And that's who guys could learn from. Mm-hmm. And that guy, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't say what that girl said. And like I said, Absolutely it's, not. it's not to say that what the woman says is always wrong. It's more so that she just doesn't have experience. Mm-hmm. It's like, why would you want to go to someone that doesn't have experience with what you want to learn? It's like, are you going to learn how to be a pilot from someone who doesn't know how to fly? Right. They've saw it done. It's like, no, you're not going to do that, right? So unless the girl's a lesbian, she doesn't know what it's like, for one. But I would say maybe women have a a fashion sense that a lot of men don't have. Oh, absolutely. I wouldn't say don't listen to their fashion suggestions. I'd say that might be something you could listen to, Mm -hmm. right? They do have an eye for that. Right, but but Some men do, too. Gay men might even be a good person to go to for a fashion sense, right? Mm -hmm. So... I have yeah. a lot of gay friends that I will regularly text a picture if I'm like going out on a date. Yeah, they're or good with I'm that. Like, yeah, what? Yeah, they're good with it. Mm-hmm. They're good. They know. Like, no, change shoes. your shoes. Nope, this has got it. No, they, and I'm like, they're big you, into the shoes, right? You're you the man. Yeah, <laughs> they're big into the shoe stuff. So one of the things I'm trying to do is just help men be good with other masculine men, other masculine energy. And if you help that part, a lot of the rest of it seems to fall into line. But okay. that, but that one part. Too. A lot of people struggle with that. You better believe the people struggling with simping, the people struggling with OnlyFans, the people struggling with kissing the ass of every pretty girl that posts a selfie on Instagram or Facebook. Mm-hmm. They're, they're under are there in the comments with a bunch of hard eyes and shit. Hideous yes, and repulsive. It makes me cringe. And I see it And I don't everywhere. think they realize that it's making the woman whose picture they're commenting on cringe They too. hate it too. Mm-hmm. I posted this the other well, day. They don't hate it. They like the attention, but well, they're they not. Like, it's both at the same time. Look, general rule of thumb, the guy she's sleeping with is absolutely not in the fucking yes. comments on any of her exactly. pictures. Most Unless they're old... dating, different situation. But otherwise, no, absolutely not. But you said it right, though. The women, they love the attention. They love the supply And men, too. Not, I mean, it goes both ways. Yes, but... it does. It does. I won't say you're wrong about that. But they like the attention. They love the attention. But they won't actually like the individual person giving it. And like just giving away all of their love and approval for nothing, right? Because that's basically what they're doing, right? Because it's got to be earned, I think, yeah, to have respect. Absolutely, to needs it. to be learned, earned, absolutely. 
So I guess we've spoken for a while here, but um, any other closing thoughts you want to give? Um, no, we covered a lot of topics. And um, just my Instagram stuff, Instagram.com slash Nick Bertuccio, Bertuccio Coaching Services.com. I'll pin these in the comments because we're going to clip this all up. Okay. And I'll pin your info in the, uh, the, the first comment of every one of them. Awesome. All right, my man. But it's good having you on here. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Over and out, everybody. Oh, there we got two hours of content.